Hello and welcome to this session. This is Professor Farhat in which we will discuss return on equity. We are going to decompose this ratio. This ratio is very important because if you remember from prior session, the growth rate of the company is dependent upon the return on equity. So we'll take return on equity times the plowback or what we called the retention ratio. What we keep times what, what we can earn that's going to determine the growth of the company. But in this session, we're going to take the ROE and break it down into various components using the DuPont analysis. Before I start, I would like to remind you to connect with me on LinkedIn if you haven't done so and subscribe to my YouTube. Like my lectures if you like them and share them. On my website, farhatlectures.com, you will find additional resources for this course, your accounting courses, and specifically for your CPA exam also you can see how well your university overall scoring on the cpa exam and this will tell you how rigor is your accounting program i don't replace your accounting courses if you have becker roger glime wiley or sergeant or any other course i don't replace them i am a compliment if you add me to those courses i will help you tremendously because i explain everything in details those cpa courses they assume you know certain level of material the assumptions that they make is what I fill for you. If something you're not aware of, you don't you don't know in depth, you did not cover in college, you can rely on my website to help you with that. So let's go ahead and start to decompose return, the important ratio return on equity. Simply put, return on equity is net profit divided by equity. Simply put, how much profit the company made or net income divided by equity. For example, if the company made 100 uh, $100 in income and they have 10% 10 10,000 of equity return on equity equal to 10% and this is basically the most basic formula for return on equity now if you want to understand the company further we want to break down this component into and this ratio into five different elements or components and we can understand each component separately and those are the five elements I'm going to show you the five elements and show you how they cancel each other out how we end up with net in profit divided by equity then i'm going to go into each component separately explain it separately show you how it affects return on equity then put the whole formula together so simply put we're going to break it into the following five ratios net profit divided by pre-tax profit pre-tax profit divided by ebit ebit divided by sales sales divided by asset asset divided by equity by equity notice what's going to happen i can cancel 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 everything what i left with is net profit divided by equity and this is this is basically in other words in other words what i'm trying to tell you this five piece formula equal to this formula the only thing is when we break it down we're going to learn more about the company we're going to learn more about the company this way we can properly analyze how well the company is doing i'm going to start with ebit divided by sale EBIT divided by sale is also called margin. Margin is very important for any company. You want to know how much a company is earning for every dollar in sales, earning before interest and taxes. In some textbook, they call, rather than they use EBIT, they use net income. Okay, and then numerator. I use EBIT because for finance, we use EBIT because we factor out interest and taxes because we're going to analyze interest and taxes separately in this formula. So what is EBIT? Let's assume again. Uh, we have EBIT of 10, sales of 100, that's equal to 10%. But what does 10% mean? It means for every dollar we are making in sales, so the denominator is sales, we are keeping $10, which is equal to 10%. So after we pay after we pay cost of goods sold, so simply put, the it would look something like the sales minus cost of goods sold minus operating expenses equal to 10, and we're started with 100. So we we consume here 90. So for one every dollar in sales, we are keeping $10. This is what 10% is. This is EBIT before we pay interest, before we pay taxes. Okay, so this is what EBIT is. Obviously, you want EBIT to be the, the higher, the better. EBIT, the higher, the better, not EBIT. Sorry, the, the, the margin is higher, the better. Obviously, EBIT, the higher, the better relative to sales. So to increase EBIT, uh, sorry, to increase the margin, either increase your EBIT without increase in sales or or increase EBIT and sales, but EBIT and faster than sales. So you wanna keep more from the money that you are selling, okay? So this is the first component is margin. The next component is what we called 
asset turnover or simply turnover. And this is another important component of this ROE computation. Okay, let's use the same sales. If we have a sales of 100, and let's assume assets of 200. 100 divided by 200 equal to 0.5 or 50 percent so what does it mean our turnover is 50 percent well the turnover is a utilization ratio it tells us how well the company is utilizing their assets so simply put they have 200 dollars in assets and from those assets they are generating 100 dollars in sales so they are milking uh 100 dollars in sales in other words 50 percent in other words for every dollar in assets they are getting 50 cent per sale now do you want this ratio to be higher? Of course you want it to be higher. How can you make it higher? Well, increase your sales or reduce your assets. Or if you could do both at the same time, that will be good. You become more efficient. You are generating more sales with less assets. But right now, it's for every dollar in assets, you are generating $50 in sales. Now, those two ratios are important, and we're going to revisit them at the end of this lecture. A little bit much more in details because they are important. Those two Major, th those two ratios together gives us ROA, return on asset, which is, okay, if you really think about it, we can eliminate sales, and what we're left with is EBIT divided by assets, which, which is return on asset. And again, I'm going to revisit this ROA, which is an important component of ROE. So ROE, part of it is ROA, return on asset, and explain to you the relationship between those two there's an important relationship a practical in the business world but we'll revisit this later now so we're done with two of out of the five component of the deep analysis basically those two let's keep going the third one i'm going to cover is asset assets divided by equity now i'm going to start by telling you if i have no debt well let, let, let's start with a simple equation assets hopefully you remember this from accounting equal to debt or liabilities it doesn't matter when i say liabilities i mean debt plus equity simply put if i have 100 dollar in assets 30 dollars in liabilities i will have 70 dollar in equity let's assume i have 100 dollar in asset zero debt it means i have 100 dollars in equity okay so simply put if i have no debt if i have no debt and i'm relying on equity Simply put, my assets would equal to my equity because I have debt equal to zero, liabilities equal to zero. So if, if I have no debt, this ratio is like non-existent, equal to one. Because if I have 100 divided by 100 or 100 million divided by 100 million, that's going to give me one. Basically, this ratio equal to one, would basically it does not exist. In other words, if the company has no debt, you know, this ratio does not affect anything. Because if you multiply something by one, it doesn't really matter. But if you have that, what's going to happen is this ratio will be greater than one. So this leverage, it's called specifically, it's the leverage component. It's called the leverage component. This ratio will be greater than one. What does that mean? For example, here, if you have 100 in assets and 70 in equity, you're going to have a ratio that's a greater than one. Now, is this good? Is this bad? Well, remember that that is risk. Well, if, if, if your leverage goes up, okay, what happened is your risk go up. But if your risk go up, your return goes up. But remember, risk is a double-edged sword. If you cannot cover the cost of interest, right, it will work against you. If you can cover the, co if you can cover the cost of interest, then leverage will work for you. And we saw this in the prior session. So simply put, the higher the leverage, the more that you have, the riskier you are. So if you are one, you have no, no debt. Once you go greater than one, then you have more debt. So let's just give you an extreme, um, well, not an extreme, but uh, let's assume we're, we have 100 in assets, um, $80 in debt, and $20 in equity. Let's compute this and show you, you know, what the, what the ratio will be. So here what we're talking about is 100 divided by 20. So let's take... 100 divided by 20 is 5. What does that mean? It means for every $1, the investors are investing in the company. For every $1 the investors are investing, you have $5 coming from debt holders. It means the company is highly leveraged. Again, is this good? Is this bad? Well, as long as you can cover the cost of debt, which is interest, then you are good. Then there is no problem whatsoever. But if you can't cover the cost of debt, then you are in trouble. Now, 
if the ratio is more than one, it means you have that. Then we have to introduce, we, then we have to compute a new, a new component of the formula, which is pre-tax profit divided by earnings before interest and taxes. Now let's walk through a, through a formula, uh, through a small income statement, partial income statement, so we see how this all works. But again, if this, if those two numbers are equal to each other, if we have 100 in assets, 100 in equity, it means we have no interest. If we have no interest, the numerator here and the denominator here, they will equal to each other. So this pre-tax profit is the same as EBIT, earnings before taxes, okay? So if we have no interest, then EBIT, EBT divided by EBT should equal also to one. So those two will not exist if we don't have if we don't have that. But since we have that, then we have to find out what is our interest burden? How much interest is burdening the company? So here's what happened. Let's assume we have earnings before interest and taxes. I'm going to make up some numbers of 120. Then our interest equal to 20. Okay, our interest equal to 20. Now we have earnings before taxes equal to 100. So what we're doing is this. We are taking 120 here and we're taking earnings before taxes which is EBIT this is the EBIT 100 okay so we want this number to be as close as possible to one the closer to one this number the lower is our interest burden simply if it's one it means if it's one what does one mean it means if you it means you have zero interest because now EBIT and EBIT equal to each other but you want this closer to one. Closer to one, it means this number is small. You want this ratio to be as close as possible to one. If you have interest, it cannot be one, okay? But you want it to be closer to one. Again, this ratio two and five, they are related because they are, effect they are affecting the leverage of the company. Matter of fact, those two ratios together, they are called the compound leverage factor. The compound leverage factor, which is the interest burden, which is this formula, this ratio, multiply by the leverage, this ratio. Those two together, they affect the leverage of the company. And we'll see how they affect the leverage in a company in a second, in a, in a, in a larger example. So let's go back and put the numbers here. We said, we said EBIT, I said 120. We have interest equal to 20. I'm just making these numbers up. It means EBT or here pre-tax profit. For us is 100 let's assume we're paying 20 percent taxes so taxes 20 percent that's 20 dollar so profit after tax equal to 80. now we want to know what is our tax burden so we wanted to know our interest burden through formula two for, through ratio two we want to know our tax burden again same concept with tax burden we want the tax burden to be as closer as possible to one Okay, an extreme example, let's assume we have, you don't have to pay taxes. If your taxes are zero and your profit is 100, if your net net profit is 100, 100 divided by 100 equal to one. Now that's not the case. We said we have to pay $20 in taxes, therefore our net profit is 80. Now it means 80 divided by 100 equal to 80%. So again, we want this number to be large. We want this ratio to be large. And the closer to one, the better off we are. It means we don't have a lot of tax burden. So why did we do this? Why did we went through all of this and broke down ROE? Well, the reason we broke it down, I'm going to revisit this a little bit more in details later on when we cover ROA in, in a minute or two, is because we wanted to know what affects our return on equity. So if you're a shareholder, what is making you profit? Is it? And we're going to find out. Is it the, mar the profit margin that the company is is, uh, is 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 experiencing is generating is it the asset turnover is it that they're using a lot of debt a lot of leverage how much interest is 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 being taken from my profit what is the burden of the tax maybe we need to move to another jurisdiction so breaking down those roe into five components analysts as well as owners analysts and owners can look at their company look at the company and analyze it under a new light, under a new light. So this is the the beauty of ROE. Decom decomposing ROE will give you a better picture exactly what's going on within the company. Now to see this a little bit further, the effect of it, just to, to play with some, not to play with some numbers, we have some numbers. Let me show you how, how it all fits together. We're, we're gonna start with a normal year. 
and we have two companies know that and some that and the computation already done all done for you so let's start with a normal year with a company with no debt the return on equity equal to eight percent well we're starting with their net profit divided by profit over tax same thing that i said it's uh, that i computed 0.8 so they have 80 divided by 100 which is 80.8 or 80 percent here because they have no debt pre-tax profit over EBIT, ebit equal to one because guess what? Because when they got to EBIT, they deducted the interest, which is zero. They came up with uh, pre-tax or EBT. I wish they used EBT here rather than pre-tax profit. So those are equal to each other because we have no interest. Interest was zero. And this will always be the case if you have no interest. Okay. Then we have EBIT, earning before interest and taxes, divided by sales, their profit margin equal to 10%. Their sales turnover, wow, is one. It means, for for example, if they have a million of assets, they're generating a million of sales, that's fine. And assets should equal, assets divided by equity equal to one. This makes sense because this company has no debt. It means if zero debt, asset equal to equity. And the compound leverage, which is two times five equal to one because one times one, I'm sorry, one times this one, equal to one right because they have no debt they have no interest therefore equal to one so this is the uh, normal year no debt let's assume we have some debt roe it's going to be 0.91 all what we did now is we changed the capital structure of the company as we change the capital structure of the company certain numbers don't change this number don't change um, this number don't change this number don't change what's going to change is your leverage you, you have more debt therefore you are leveraged and obviously if you have that ratio number two will 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 change as well here we are assuming you have that and you earn more than the that the cost of that as a result your return on equity went up one point uh, 1.1 percent so notice how using that will increase your equity and no, will increase your return on equity why because you, you're using other people's money and shareholders because they have less equity therefore they they share more in the profit okay now let's assume it's a bad year and you have no debt now now we're going to use a scenario of bad years you have no debt well the numbers uh, return on equity equal to four percent simply put the numbers will be very similar very similar to no debt you know 80 percent know that one to one a uh, margin is now you are earning rather than 10 percent you are earning 6.2 you're selling less your asset to equity ratio equal to one so overall notice what happened if you have no debt no debt and you have a bad year your roe is cut in half now let's assume you have some debt and what happened to your roe if you have some debt and it's a bad year so you cannot cover the cost of that. Your ROE goes from 9.1 to 2.4. So this is the effect of that. When you cannot cover your debt expense and you are leveraged and you go through a bad year, you get really hammered. Okay. Why? Because here the compound leverage is 0.6. You have some debt. It's affecting you negatively. Well, on the other hand, if it's a good year, if it's a good year, uh, your return on equity would know that equal to 12%. Okay. However, if you have some debt and it's a good year, your return on equity equal to 15.7. And this shows you the effect, the positive effect of debt in good years. Here you have, you are leveraged 1.667. You have, uh, uh, so two and five, you have two and five, you have two and five that are high, which is good. You want that because you're in good years. You're going to do tremendously well. Okay, so this is how it all fits together. So that is a double-edged sword. In good years, you will do well. In bad years, you'll get penalized. Okay, and how do we do this? By broken into the by broken it down by the Dupont analysis. I want to go back and revisit ROA because I told you ROA is very important in in computing return on equity because ROA has nothing to do with leverage. ROA only deals with how well the company is operating the business because you want to look at ROA. The first thing is, you know, you, you don't, let, why? Why ROA is important? Let me just tell you why. Because let, let's think about it. Number five, number two, and number one, which is your tax burden, your interest burden, and your leverage. 
Two and five has to do with your financing policy, how you finance your company. Number one has to do with the government. You have no control over that. Or or you can yeah, you might have some control. Maybe you can move out, move from you from, from that jurisdiction, but, but in a sense is if you can't move, you cannot control the tax burden because the government imposed that on you. Therefore, what's important to look at when you're when you're analyzing ROE is ROA. It doesn't mean it doesn't mean the other one are not important. What I'm trying to say, uh, the ROA tells you exactly how well a business is doing. And basically, we're going we're gonna to be looking at two ROA, one for a supermarket chain and one for a utility company. They both have a 10% ROA. But if we look at margin times asset turnover, we notice that the supermarket, they only make 2%, and that's pretty high margin. It means for every dollar they sell, they only keep two pennies. And for, for every $100, they keep $2. That's not a high margin. However, their asset turnover is pretty high. It means for every dollar in sales, I'm sorry, for every dollar in asset, they generate $5 in sales. Their asset turnover, 5 over 1, it's pretty high. And this is how they come up with 5%. The utility company, they have a high margin it means for every dollar in sales they keep 20 pennies that's pretty high decent margin however their asset turnover is low it means for every dollar in assets they only generate 50 pennies in sales that's why their asset turnover equal to 0.5 but overall when we look at the end at roa equal to 10 percent they both equal to 10 percent what is the what is the point that, that i'm trying to make the point that i'm trying to make is this no company no company, at least on a permanent basis or semi-permanent basis, maybe for a short period of time, could be high on margin and high on asset turnover. Let's think about it. Let's think about this. They cannot be high, both high at the same time. Let's take Apple as an example. The Apple. When the iPhone came out, when the iPhone came out, for a, for a short period of time, Apple had a monopoly. In other words, um, you know, they had no competitors. They could sell the, if you want to buy the phone, you have really no other option, quasi monopoly. So what happened is when you have that type of power, you can charge high prices. High prices gives you high margin, high profit margin, and you can sell a lot because you have no competition. What happened then? Well, if that's the case, if a company is experiencing high margin and high asset turnover, what happened naturally, other companies will go into that market and will start to chip on them. They will start to take away either their profit or their sales. So if, if Apple wants to keep the high margin, they can. But once Google comes with a new phone and start to take sales from them, asset turnover will start to decrease, will go back to normal. Therefore, if they want to keep a high margin, uh, asset turnover will go down. Well, if let's assume Apple chooses to, 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 uh, to have more sales. Well, if they want to have more sales, that's fine. If they want to sell more, they have to lower their prices. Therefore, their margin, their profit margin will go down. So simply put, there is always that pull pull and push between margin and asset turnover. And this graph will clearly show us this is a, a turnover for 45 different industries. So it's not even a company to say, well, maybe it's, it's uh, skewed one way or another. We're talking about industries. For example, here we have the food, food stores generally supermarket they have this is the profit margin on the y-axis this is the x-axis and this is the y-axis on the x-axis we have asset turnover they have a turnover of three which is pretty high pretty high so they're they're, they're to the right they're, they're, this is pointed right but notice their their operating their operating profit is what their operating estimate may be two two percent so notice their turnover is high but they don't make a lot of money on every dollar in sales. If we look at this company here, I don't know in what industry this is, but we're looking at it here. They have a high profit margin, which is approximately 23%. That's a high profit margin. But when we look at their asset turnover, it's 0.4. So in other words, you cannot be here. You cannot be here. What does it mean to be here? It means you have high asset turnover you have in high asset turnover and high operating profit it doesn't work that way and if if you do if you do experience that you'll experience it for a short period of time and if you experience it on a permanent basis rest assured uncle sam will intervene and they will break you up because this is a monopoly when you can sell a lot and make a good profit margin if that's if that happens you're just basically naturally you invite the competition 
and assuming you are operating in a capitalistic society, competition can enter that industry and start to chip away either from your margin or from your sales. Then you'll go back to normal. So a company could be out here for a short period of time, then it will go back to the normal uh, uh, the normal uh, the normal ROA asset turnover uh, inter in interception basically someplace in here okay this is basically kind of not an efficient frontier but basically it's very hard to cross this to cross this to, to be here or to be here or to be here you might do it for a short for example this is computer peripheral that's outside that's good they have a very high profit margin and a decent relatively a decent asset turnover but let let this will be maybe, maybe for a short period of time. Then once the competition comes in, it's either they have to, this will go lower. The, in other words, their profit margin will go down or their asset turnover will go to the left and they'll go back to within the overall industry. Okay. Now, if you like this recording, please like it and share it. Again, I'm going to invite you to my, visit my website, especially if you're a CPA candidate or accounting student. If you're a CPA candidate, keep your cpa course i, I you know I, I cannot replace it i wish i can but i can have in addition to your cpa course lectures like these plus practice questions to help you prepare for the for your cpa prep course help you succeed on the cpa exam the cpa exam is a lifetime investment take it seriously and uh, once you pass that's it one time you don't have to do it again so invest in your time and career so you'll put it behind you and focus what you need to focus on. Good luck, study hard, and stay safe.